Hello Year 10, this is Miss Tolman talking to you and on this video I'm going to be talking you through um, the poem Poppies. Um, the poet for Poppies uh, was Jane Weir um, and I'm going to be talking about it, I'm going to be going through it with you and uh, I'm going to be trying to link it for you to the theme of identity in particular. Um, so looking at some of the ideas going through it um, and trying to uh, understand a bit more clearly how, how it could help us to, to think about that theme, the theme of identity. So hopefully anyone who has, uh, you know, been looking through their poems any time this year, you might r remember that this is a, a poem about a woman who is losing her son. Um, so... Uh, you notice I didn't say that her son died and the reason why I'm saying that is because actually something we're going to talk about later uh, when we look at the poem in more detail is the fact that there there's quite a lot in the poem's story in inverted commas the plot of the of the poem that isn't 100% clear and we're going to I'm going to talk about that a bit more in a second but uh, it does it doesn't really matter it's not important because really what it's about is the sort of the feeling and the idea of loss and of uh, a mother's experience uh, in that way so um the poem is actually a dramatic monologue meaning that the mother is the speaker um she's an invented character so although I will give you some background information about Jane Weir in a minute um we mustn't conflate or match the, the speaker and the poet. But, so she's an invented character, um, but Jane Weir is trying to put herself in the position of uh, a mother losing her son. So why is it a dramatic monologue? Um, because the speaker, the mother, is she's the only one whose voice we hear um, throughout the whole poem. So she uses the word you and she's speaking to her son. But the son never answers. And again, we might want to think about why that's the case, uh, because there's there's clearly a sense of absence. So he's not actually there. She's talking to him, but he's not actually there. OK, so um, Jane Weir said some interesting things about when she was writing this poem or why she wanted to write it. She said that she wanted to think about. So this is where we mustn't try to imagine that she's the mother in the poem. She has got children, she is a mother, but uh, she was she was imagining. She said she wanted to try to think about the idea of losing a child and what that must feel like. She said, as a mother, I tried to put myself in the position of people who may have lost someone. So she's thinking about conflict in particular here. And she mentions uh, other possibilities apart from sons. So husbands, lovers and, and children. So essentially the idea of women being left behind, um, you know, while, while the men go off to war and the experience of, of, of losing someone that you love. Um, she's also said that Poppies is a poem of remembrance. She said that she wants it to be about remembering the dead, but remembering them, I'm reading out what she said, remembering them not just uh, dead, but as alive and active. So sometimes when we think about the word remembrance or Remembrance Day, also called Armistice Day, which is going to be in the poem, um, we associate those ideas very much with uh, the two world wars, World War One, World War Two, and she is very clear uh, when she says, uh, and this is again a quote from her, people are fighting now in wars and are also dying. It's important for each generation to remember that. So she published this poem, or the poem was published rather, in 2005, so she doesn't tell us in the poem which conflict she's talking about. And again, that doesn't really matter. It's about the universal experience of, again, you know, someone being left behind uh, and losing someone in a conflict. Um, OK, so now there's Jane Weir. Um, as you, I'm sure you can remember, because you have done this poem before, we know that a poppy is a red flower like the one pinned onto that person's jacket right there, the lapel of their jacket. Um, and the reason why they are a symbol, symbolism is, is very important, so they represent something. The reason why they are a symbol of remembrance is because these flowers grew naturally uh, in fields 
um, in Europe where lots of World War I battles had taken place. So they sort of became associated with this idea of, you know, um, battles and death and destruction. But they sort of, they, I guess, that they, they might in some way symbolise life because they grew in those fields after after the war was after the wars were over. Okay, so I want us to think about some key words and concepts uh, before we start looking at the poem. Um, so I'm going to talk you through those, um, and I want us to think about the real sort of nuts and bolts of these words as well, so that we can start to you know um, understand them more deeply. So the first word I want us to think about is remembrance. Now, remembrance is a noun. So we all know about the, the verb form, which is remember. Um, and remember doesn't sound as serious as remembrance. Um, so remembering can be something like, oh, you know, I remembered to pick up my bag on my way out the house. But remembrance is much more strong and formal in some way so it's like a, an act of remembering okay a conscious a conscious decision to remember something so the root that i want you to look at is mem and of course you you know you may have already realized this that you would you would see that root in a lot of words to do with remembering so we've got remember remembrance memory um memorial memo, all these things which are about sort of making a decision to think back uh, about the past, about something in the past. Um, so that's the first word I want us to be really conscious of when we're looking at the poem. The second word that I want us to be really conscious of looking at the poem is domestic. Now domestic again you probably have heard this in lots of different contexts. Um, domestic animals our pets, um, domestic versus commercial. So domestic would be uh, things to do with people's private houses, whereas commercial is to do with businesses. Um, and it comes from, here's the root, it comes from the word domus, which is Latin, and it means house. So domestic is an adjective. You could talk about domestic servants. That would be quite kind of old fashioned now, but uh, people who would work in people's houses. Um, but the noun is a bit tricky to remember maybe, but domesticity is the noun. And the reason why I want us to think about this is because traditionally the realm of the domestic was very much the sort of the, the sort of the realm of women. Women were, you know, extremely sort of traditionally associated, of course, as you know, with the home, being in the home. And Again, traditionally, wrongly, I would argue, but again, traditionally, um, the domestic sphere was not considered important in literature or in art because, you know, from a sort of a, perhaps from a male perspective, well, nothing really happens at home. So what's the point? Um, the women didn't go off and fight in the wars, so they don't need to be written about in terms of their experience. So I think what Jane Weir and lots of other writers as, as well are trying to do is to sort of put the female experience on the map a little bit more in the sense that, yes, OK, she didn't, uh, you know, the, the mother in the poem, she didn't go and fight in a war, but she suffered as a result of the conflict because she was left at home. She was left at home and that in and of itself was... Um, uh, something that had a massive effect on her life through the loss of, of her son. This is, again, the character in the poem. Okay, the third word I want us to think about is ambiguity. So that's the noun. You might have heard the adjective before, ambiguous. And the root I want us to think about there is ambi. So be or by often means to, like bicycle. Um, ambi means in two ways. So if something's ambiguous, it means it can be understood in two different ways, at least, at least two different ways. If somebody is ambidextrous, it means they can use both their right hand and their left hand. So ambiguity is about meaning. It's about interpretation of meaning and the fact that sometimes there isn't a sort of a straight uh, answer to uh, what's being communicated. And that's often 
Um, when it comes to writing and when it comes to literature, that's often intentional. So the, the writer wants you to think about the possible meanings and they've made their uh, message or not their message, but their idea in that particular part of the, of the poem or the text. They've made it ambiguous on purpose. So putting these three uh, words together with our theme, I want us to think about how these words might relate to the idea of uh, our identity. So what contributes to our identity? Um, so again, thinking about memory. Are memories important for our identity? Of course, we know that memories can be unreliable. You can remember things one way and somebody else might remember them in a completely different way. But maybe the way that that you specifically remember something is a hugely important factor in your identity. Um, again, the domestic. So also, how does that contribute to, to someone's identity, particularly um, women and the perspective of women and the fact that their stories, their narratives are somewhat sidelined or marginalized because, as I was saying, uh, the domestic is trivialized and uh, considered, you know, less historically important, but it's still a huge part of a woman's identity. Uh, you know, having a family, um, being left at home, all of those things. And then lastly, ambiguity. So how, how can that relate to our identity? Um, is it the case that our identity is only strong if everything is very clearly one thing or another? Or is sometimes the sort of the fluid, ambiguous meanings and interpretations that exist in real life, do they sometimes contribute to our identity as well, perhaps? OK, so what I want us to think about while we're reading the poem, which I'm going to read to you in a second, is what what is we're saying what is she saying about identity that we can relate to as her readers as a universal experience? Now, this idea of a universal experience is really important. It's kind of it fits into big picture, actually, if you're thinking about your small, medium, big picture analysis. And it's particularly important in poetry because when we think about big picture in Romeo and Juliet, and I know that, you know, we want to understand um, the sort of the context, the social context at the time. Uh, that those characters, you know, were, were when it was set and when Shakespeare was alive. But often in poetry, that's much less important. But what, the, what uh, a poet is always trying to do is to communicate something that we can identify or relate to. So if I give you an, a really silly example, if I were to tell you that I had an experience on a Monday morning, I had an experience where I missed the number 29 bus and then I spilt my coffee all over myself and then I dropped my phone and then I realised I'd forgotten my house keys. Those, that, that as a Monday morning is a very specific experience. So we couldn't, we couldn't say that that's universal because that's, you know, very, very, very clear, specific things that happened to me. But if I say that I had a dreadful Monday morning, then that is a universal experience because we can all relate to that. We can all relate to, even if we haven't ever had a bad Monday morning, we can relate to the fact that it could happen to anyone, basically. So loss, the loss of a loved one could happen to anyone. Uh, being a mother, being a parent, that's a universal experience as well. It's something we can all relate to, whether we're having that experience at the time or not. OK. So now we're going to have a look at the poem itself. Now, one thing I want to just remind everybody of, hopefully you know this already, but I want to remind you that when it comes to poetry, we don't read line to line. We use the punctuation, okay? Punctuation is there to create the meaning with you. If you read uh, without looking at the punctuation, um, then the meaning can be lost or significantly more confusing than it needs to be, okay? So some of the sentences within the poem, this poem in particular, are quite long at times, but um, that will have been done on purpose as well. So the point is, as I'm reading it, I want you to see that I'm reading with the punctuation. Okay, here we go. Three days before our Mr. Sunday, 
and poppies had already been placed on individual war graves. Before you left, I pinned one onto your lapel, crimped petals, spasms of paper red, disrupting a blockade of yellow bias binding around your blazer. Sellotape bandaged around my hand, I rounded up as many white cat hairs as I could, smoothed down your shirt's upturned collar, steeled the softening of my face. I wanted to graze my nose across the tip of your nose, play at being Eskimos like we did when you were little. I resisted the impulse to run my fingers through the gelled blackthorns of your hair. All my words, flattened, rolled, turned into felt, slowly melting. I was brave as I walked with you to the front door, threw it open, the world overflowing like a treasure chest. A split second and you were away, intoxicated. After you'd gone, I went into your bedroom, released a songbird from its cage. Later, a single dove flew from the pear tree and this is where it has led me, skirting the churchyard walls, my stomach busy, making tucks, darts, pleats, hatless without a winter coat or reinforcements of scarf, gloves. On reaching the top of the hill, I traced the inscriptions on the war memorial, leaned against it like a wishbone. The dove pulled freely against the sky, an ornamental stitch. I listened, hoping to hear your playground voice catching on the wind. Okay, so very quickly, a very, very quick summary of what's happening here. Time is quite hard to uh, track. Of course, we do have quite a sort of a, a linear narrative at the start of maybe kind of like up to two thirds into the poem where, you know, we've got a sort of a, a fairly clear image of a mother saying goodbye to her son. So he hasn't left yet. She's saying goodbye. She opens the door and then he does leave. It's more the the sort of the, the aftermath of his departure where it's not 100% clear if this is straight after he left or whether she is projecting into the future where she's lost him in some much more significant way. Um, it's quite fluid. So we'll come to that again a little bit, uh, a little bit later. Okay, so let's have a look then at the first stanza. So I'm going to go through the poem stanza by stanza. So there are four. The two in the middle are quite a bit longer than the two at the end. We can again maybe think about that if we have time later. So the first thing I'm going to tell you is that I'm, I've got things in bold and I'm going to talk about those um, specifically. Um, I'm also using a colour code and I'm going to talk about that right now. So the reason why I am throughout the poem using the colours blue and red the reason is because you will notice that there is quite a lot of uh, example. There are quite a lot of examples of sort of military war imagery, um, and I will explain them as we go. So I'm using those as red. Okay, so when you see red, you know that that's another example of of, of war or military imagery that I'm talking about. Um, and then the blue is sort of the more quiet, domestic, practical uh, imagery of the home or the home life. OK, so again, I'll explain it as we go. But that's the that's what the blue represents. OK, so let's have a look at the first uh, piece of language that I've picked out. And that is had already been placed. So the reason why I picked this out is because this is called the passive voice. What that means is it's saying that somebody put the poppies on the graves, but we don't know who did that. OK, and often the poppy, the, the passive voice, sorry. So often the passive voice is used when you when you don't know who's done something, but often it is also used when it doesn't matter. 
So what's important is that the, the remembrance has happened. It's not important in this message who specifically has put those poppy, poppies on those graves, okay? So the, 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 what, what's important again is the, the sort of the, the, the national remembrance, okay? And our Mr. Sunday, just to remind you in case you weren't sure, is that day in November, I think it's the 11th when it is the Remembrance Day, the day that, you know, um, the peace was signed at the end of oh, World War One or World War Two. I can't remember which. Um, peace was signed and then ever after we remember those who died in, in a war on that day. OK, armistice means agreeing to, to stop to stop fighting, basically. It's a, an agreement of peace. OK. Individual war graves. So I've picked that out as well. And the reason is because the word individual highlights the experience of each single soldier. So it's that idea of war being a sort of a, 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 a sort of an enormous and overwhelming concept that is extremely broad and affects entire nations. But it's made up of participants who are individuals. Um, so, yeah, so each grave, each grave represents an actual human, a, a single human, and she is uh, trying to sort of remind us of that. Okay, so next we have our colour coding. So, if you have a look, you can see that we've got two examples of the military imagery. So, spasm, spasms, anyone who's ever, I don't know, injured themselves in a P lesson maybe, or playing some kind of sport, it's, it, it, there's this idea of pain. So it's kind of hard really to get that image when you think about that the, the poppy, the picture of the poppy I showed you. Um, but the crimp, it's kind of like a, like a, I don't know, like a kind of a, something about the burst of the, sort of like a burst of the paper red. Um, but the, the idea of the spasm being something tight and painful, okay? Um, and then we've got a blockade. So she's talking about here is a very specific detail around the edge of his blazer um, called bias binding, which is kind of like a little kind of edging that goes around the edge. Of, well, an edging that goes around the edge, haha, um, that goes around the edge of his lapel. And uh, and a blockade is, uh, again, it's, it's metaphorical. It's, you've got this idea of people, soldiers, having control over other people. So if soldiers put up a blockade, then they're not going to allow you to go past that. So there's a sort of, there's an element of restriction there. Okay. And then you've got your domestic imagery. So clothes, the lapel, the blazer. Uh, the bias binding, those are all things to do with sort of details within the home. And you've got flowers, of course, which are the petals um, and and the paper, because it's not a real poppy. It's a it's a paper. It's a paper poppy with paper petals. OK, so we've got that contrast. So all the way through the poem, we've got that sort of interweaving of these two very contrasting semantic fields. And when we get to the end, um, we can think about why maybe uh, Jane Weir chose to do that. OK, sellotape bandaged around my hand. I rounded up as many white cat hairs as I could, smoothed down your shirt's upturned collar, steeled the softening of my face. OK, so the first thing I've picked out there that isn't to do with those two semantic fields is steeled the softening of my face. So we've got a bit of sibilance there. Sibilance is the S sound, steeled the softening. Um, she's basically saying that she's trying hard to, she's feeling emotional and she's trying hard not to show it. So her face might be uh, in danger of showing how she's really feeling and she wants to be strong so she tries to harden her expression so that she's not um revealing how how sad she is um but it's interesting the words that she's chosen because you know the word steel something very hard metallic um and sort of something that is unyielding it's immo it's immovable you cannot get past it um, you could also stretch it a little bit and say that there's uh, connotations of weaponry. 
Um, so essentially, you know, she's a mother. She's got she's got sadness. She's got feelings, and she's trying to make them hard and resist. Okay. So I was thinking maybe the sibilance could represent the effort, the sort of it's a, it's a long continuous sound, the sort of the effort that she's making to um, to control her emotions, possibly. Um, the next thing I picked out was my nose and your nose. So she's talking here about the fact that she wants to um, be very sort of tactile and um, affectionate with him. She wants to rub her nose on his nose and it's very childish. Um, that sort of repetition and echoing, that's a little bit how you might speak to a child um, when you're kind of, when they're learning how to talk or whether they're, when they're very, very little. So there's, um, so yeah, so the words echoey, um, there's repetition of the word nose, of course, and then there's the sort of the echoing of this idea, uh, my nose and your nose. So she's clearly remembering um, his, his childhood. Um, she is also here, again, it's about affection and love. So she wants to, she also, as well as wanting to, um, touch his nose with her nose she also wants to touch his hair and um, she says she wants to run her fingers through his hair but she doesn't do that um and we can sort of imagine he's he's obviously put put gel in it so it's sticking up in 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 kind of thorny a, a sort of a thorny style um and my interpretation here might be that he is because he's leaving and he he wants to go so, you know, when, when we get later on in the poem, you'll be able to see he's not feeling sad. He's, he's ready. He's ready to leave. He wants to go and explore and have adventures. So there's this sense of him sort of, you know, being very kind of well prepared and he's made all this effort. Um, he's kind of, you know, he's styled his hair specially and so she doesn't want to mess it up. So she resists the temptation to, um, to touch his hair. Okay. And then um, I've also given you another, again, maybe a slightly more stretched idea that we could maybe imagine it being like she feels like it's a thorn pricking her, that she, she can't be as affectionate with her son anymore as she wants to be because he's grown up now and he wants to, he wants to leave. He wants to move. He wants to leave home. Um, okay. So all my words flattened, rolled turned into felt. So this is a metaphorical or figurative image. Um, she's talking about how she's got a lot to say, but she can't, she can't get it out. She's, she's sort of, she's pushing it down so that she doesn't reveal too much about how she feels. Um, if you might remember from when you did this poem the first time, felt is like a kind of a it's a material that's very thick and it's made through, I'm not sure exactly, but it's made from wool and it's like layers and layers of wool being like really kind of pushed, uh, pushed together essentially. So it's very dense um, and it's very kind of impacted. So she's basically like pushing her words down. She's not expressing them. She's not kind of giving in to, to what she feels. Um, and then we've got our little... Uh, oh, sorry. And one more thing. Um, so when it says like we did when you were little, it's emphasizing how he is not little anymore. She wishes that he was. Um, and you get the sense that she she sort of wants to protect him. Um, and, you know, you can t you can tell from from some of the affection that she she wishes she could show. OK, then we've got our imagery. So we've got bandaged injury, trying to kind of look after an injury, graze, gives sort of like if you graze your knee, it's like a bit of a wound, something painful, um, rounded up, meaning, you know, when you round up prisoners, you capture them. Um, I resisted the impulse. Um, you might talk about, uh, especially for World War II, you often hear about the French resistance, meaning that uh, civilians are trying not to give in to occupying soldiers. And then again, contrasted with the domestic imagery, so sellotape, pets, like the cat hairs, clothes again. So she's basically, she's trying to make him presentable by um, using sellotape to um, pick up the cat hairs on his, on his clothes. 
Okay, stanza three. Now, the reason I have put the very first S there in bold is to point out it is not a capital. So if we go back for a second, you will see that there is enjambment here, but uh, remember, by the way, that enjambment is where a sentence goes over two or more lines. So this enjambment, it doesn't just go over two lines, it actually goes into the next stanza. So there's a, a real br um, kind of break between the stanzas, okay? There's a big a, a big gap there. So what could that gap suggest? Well, it's symbolic of a strong break. So in the middle of the sentence, there is a, a break, not just between lines, as I was saying, but between stanzas. So what could that suggest? It could suggest that her bond with her son has been broken because he's left, or it could suggest that her heart is broken, um, or that her connection with him in some way is broken because he's not there anymore. Um, so again, you know, this is this is an example of, of that idea of sort of ambiguity where there's there's a strong sense of something, but it's she's not being very clear about exactly specifically what what has happened. Um, then she talks about um, so this is the point at which he actually leaves now. She says, I was brave as I walked with you to the front door. So there's an incongruity there. So if something is incongruous, it means it doesn't quite match or it doesn't quite fit. Um, and the reason it might be a bit incongruous is because usually when you think about bravery, it's sort of soldiers. It's like um, in the charge of the light brigade, those soldiers are described as bold and brave. And she's talking about herself as being brave. Um, and she's, as we've talked about, she's the one who's who's being left at home. So I think she's encouraging us to think about the fact that we don't think enough about people who are left at home when they have loved ones uh, going off to war. Um, okay, she walked with the son to the front door, threw it open. So there's, again, there's a contrast with her emotions. If you throw open a door, you open it very sort of freely and uh, sort of open. Yeah, you're sort of, you're, you're, not, you're not resisting. You're being very kind of free with your action. So even though she doesn't want him to leave, she is letting him go. She's letting him go. And there's... Uh, I think a sense there of the type of bravery that mothers and women have to show in, you know, not wanting something to happen so incredibly badly and at the same time in some way accepting it and allowing it because the son wants to go, okay? And how do we know he wants to go? Well, because of the next bit. It says the world overflowing like a treasure chest now, this is one of the few points in the poem. It's not that the sun is speaking. It's still, a, it's still a monologue. But we do kind of get this sense of the sun's perspective. So she's not thinking about the world as a treasure chest. It's the sun who is so excited about going and having his, his life and his adventure. But there's also this kind of sense of perhaps this image, this simile being a bit childish um, that, you know, he feels like this adventure is going to be like, a, a, you know, an exciting treasure. But really, if he's going off to war, well, we all know, you know, what 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 the outcome could be. So, you know, there's a sense that he's maybe being a bit naive if that if that's his sort of his his feeling. OK, then a bit later, she says, after you'd gone, I went into your bedroom so if you remember at the start of the poem, not right at the beginning, but like in the first stanza, she says, before you left. So there's a kind of an echo or a mirroring here after you'd gone with before you left. So we're really getting a kind of a deep instinct, insight into her experience, her experience before he left and her experience after he left. So we don't go with him when he goes. We stay with her who's left behind and we you know, follow her experience. Um, so I think, you know, that, that structural choice um, with the pattern um, is helping us to really see uh, the impact on her of uh, her son leaving. Okay, then we've got released a songbird from its cage. 
Now this is pretty ambiguous. It's a metaphor. I uh, I think it's very unlikely that it, we're talking about a real songbird here. So what could it represent? Uh, she went into his bedroom. So is he the song songbird? She's releasing him that he's been kept at home with his mom and he doesn't want to be there anymore and she's letting him go. Or have we fast forwarded to a time when she actually has heard confirmation of his death and she's releasing his soul in some way, that the songbird re represents his soul? Or is it that she's been holding her emotions so tightly and now because he's gone and she doesn't have to hide what she's feeling anymore, she can she can release those. So it's not clear. Um, and that's okay. That's okay. We can still get, we can still look at the universal experience without uh, knowing exactly uh, what is happening at this point. Um, okay. I think that's all for those. Oh, yes. And then, um, so back to our um, semantic fields. So look at the look at the red um, words. We've got brave. So again, as I've said, you know, soldiers have to be brave. That's something that we kind of associate with fighting. A dove is a symbol of peace, um, but it's also a symbol of mourning. So we're going to come to that in the last stanza. You'll see in a second. And then reinforcements. Um, if you want, if you need or you've called for reinforcements, it's it's like backup in a battle. And then again, contrasting with the domestic imagery. So you've got those tucks, darts, pleats. Those are all like little folds that you might make if you're sewing. And it's an interesting image because she's saying my, my stomach is busy making little folds. So I, hopefully you can imagine that's not a great feeling she's suggesting here. It's almost like a kind of an anxious, nervous, churning feeling in your stomach. Um, but she's using this imagery of, um, of sewing and, you know, mending perhaps um, and making things, making clothes um, to describe this feeling of, of her as, as, the, as the person left behind. And then you've got these practical things like uh, she says she's she's going to the um, the churchyard, but she's hatless, so it's obviously cold. Well, of course, it's Armistice um, Day, so it's in November. Um, she's hatless. She didn't bring a hat. She doesn't have a winter coat. She doesn't have, have scarf or gloves, so she doesn't feel protected. She doesn't have those reinforcements. She doesn't have the protection of even the warm clothes to protect her from how she's feeling. Okay, last stanza. So we now are following her to the top of the hill, which is, again, an imagined place where she is now in the churchyard. And she says that she traced, I traced the inscriptions. So here we've really got this remembrance. The names of the people who died are carved into the stone already. OK, so that's what inscription means. It means script means writing and it's inscribed, meaning it's actually carved into the stone. Um, but she doesn't want to let herself forget. So she's almost using her finger to kind of go over the, the, the words so that she can really remember the names. OK, so it's really active remembering. Um, she leaned against it. So it's obviously, uh, well, as war memorials often are, you know, like a big piece of stone, basically. So she says she leaned against it like a wishbone. So here we have a simile. A wishbone is a curved bone. Um, and often, you know, two, you can use it with another person where you both grab one end each and you pull it apart. And the person who gets the bigger bit can make a wish. So we've got a couple of images here. One is the shape that she's making. Um, but of course, it could be a symbol. Is it, do we think it's a symbol of hope? Or rather, is it a symbol of lost hope where she has she's wishing for something that's completely impossible because it's too late? She's lost her son in some permanent way. Um, and, you know, it's it's completely pointless wishing for his return. Um, we've got the dove again. Here again, I would say because she's in the churchyard, it, it definitely suggests this idea of mourning. Um, but it says that the dove 
pulled freely so it's it's flying obviously we've got this idea if it's pulling maybe it's windy perhaps um well actually it does mention the wind but we've got this image of her of the sorry of the dove being free that's the that's the important thing so there's a sense of letting go there's a sense of acceptance and a, and a sense of perhaps maybe letting go of her grief perhaps um that her grief is sort of it, her is free there's a sort of a flow in her emotions now um and then the very end of the poem i think is really interesting because it's almost like a flashback because she says i listened hoping to hear your playground voice catching on the wind so it's like she wants to turn the clock back to when he was a little boy and she was still able to protect him so there's a kind of a an inversion there where at the end of the poem she's actually trying to flash back to before he'd even left um and again obviously we can we can see how from her point of view that's completely impossible um but it's something that she um feels incredibly sad about and then finally with our two semantic fields well obviously we've got the word war very straightforward there in terms of our military imagery very direct and then we've also got the domestic imagery again so sewing children okay so home home life looking after children taking care of the home okay so i want us to now think about the universal experiences that are being presented in the poem so what is she really saying about her identity i i would say that she is she is definitely not suggesting that her identity or that the identity of women civilian women who uh don't directly um get involved in conflicts that that is no less important or significant than um the soldiers who are fighting of course it's a different type of suffering um but it is incredibly important and valid to uh to to sort of human experience um in terms of identity also we've got well of course it's a very it's a very female identity that she is presenting here the 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 main sort of contributing factor to this mother this character this speaker in the poem is that she's a mother is that she is domestic that her her life is l- limited or revolves around the home and you know she she constantly mentions uh objects and elements from the home and and how you know that that is that is clearly sort of her realm and is very sort of important in terms of contributing to her identity there and then we've got yes the ambiguity so the fact that yeah it's not always straightforward who uh it's not always straightforward you know what happens in life the contradiction that 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 has been presented the fact that she she knew she needed to let her son go but then simultaneously she also felt uh, a very strong sense of 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 not wanting him to leave um and the fact that you know that there there's there's ambiguity potentially even for the mother herself where there's elements of what she's experiencing that she doesn't fully understand or she doesn't fully have clarity on herself as well so what about the last thing i want to talk about is why did i color code those the the two uh, semantic fields i think one of the things that it's really important to think about is this kind of blending of the domestic and the military so this idea that it's constantly on her mind you know even when she's going about her day to day thinking about scarves and gloves and things she's constantly thinking about her son who is not there with her um because he is either fighting or has already died and she has lost him in some way um so yeah it's the it's the the effect of that being constantly kind of interwoven into her life um as a woman at home okay thank you very much your 10 hope that was helpful see you soon i hope